may not necessarily represent the views of Umma Channel. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Newswatch with me, Mohammed Shafiq, live from our studios in Blackburn. It's 8.30 on Tuesday. Uh, tonight we're talking about the Khilafa Conference, which is an initiative that has been launched by Isbut Tahrir. Now, Isbut Tahrir have a, a reputation, if you like, uh, a lot of questions are, are about that particular organisation. So tonight we want to uh, focus on the organisation, but more importantly, focus on what they're doing um, and take some of your questions about what you think about this organisation. Uh, the number is on your screen, 01254 277370. And Twitter, Mshafiq UK. And on Facebook, the official my channel page is on there. And you can get in touch with us in a variety of ways. Let me introduce our guest. He's a member of his Butari. His name is Sharif Afiji. So Sharif, bye. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us no tonight. Jazak khair for having me on. Um, Khilafa Conference, what is it about? It's on the, July, for our music, it's on July the 7th. It's happening in Manchester. You and told me it's, all, it's already sold out, so... Uh, well, maybe there's a few tickets still left that yeah. people can buy online. We also got one on the 30th of June this uh, coming weekend, and that's in London as well. So the 7th of July is in Manchester, the 30th of June is in London. Now, what's the purpose of it? Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to present the Islamic solutions uh, to some of the problems that we're seeing around uh, in the Muslim world. We've seen in the last 18 months now, uh, across the Middle East, uh, uprisings, revolutions that are taking place, uh, places like Tunisia, right across to Bahrain. And many people are now discussing what type of government they want, what's the nature and the role of Islam within politics. And what we're here to do is present the Islamic solutions to some of the endemic problems we see uh, within this region. Okay, and clearly, uh, the Arab Spring, the, you know, Islam, Islamic parties in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in Jordan, in Morocco, uh, in Algeria, potentially in Libya as well. Uh, people are, um, uh, what people are just, uh, you know, voting for Islam, aren't they? Well, that's right, and this is what we see as the natural sentiments of the Muslims, which is that they are gravitating towards Islamic solutions anyway. The problem is, though, is that the regimes haven't really changed. What they've changed is the colour and the face. So these elections are still rigged and they're still biased yeah. towards a secular elite. Uh, so the problem therefore is that many Muslims want to see Islam established within society, but unfortunately the way the system works, they won't see that into fruition. Okay, let's go to B Bradford and talk to Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, brother Muhammad. Wa alaikum as um, I've just got a, a little question for the uh, guest that you have on today. Um, basically, um, there's there's a lot being out in the media uh, about his book uh, and some of that has been negative. <coughs> uh, I think this is a good opportunity for your host to clarify uh, a few of the uh, maybe I don't know misconceptions or are they true? I don't know. You, you you've got the platform there to to clarify that. Uh, many people have mentioned, um, you know, the, uh, the fact that you're, you know, you're extremist, you're, you're extremist in your viewpoint. Um, they associate you sometimes with al-Muhajirun. So I think, you know, you have a good opportunity to, to clarify a few of those points. I'd just like you to explain a little bit around, because, you know, a lot of people blame and point fingers at certain organizations, but we have to be objective and we have to give the person representing a, a party the opportunity to at least explain their, their, their position on, on matters such as, you know, uh, overthrowing some, some, some groups out there believe that it's, it's safe to overthrow governments, um, you know, in countries that they live in. So if you can clarify a few of those misconceptions, uh, that would be very much appreciated, I think, for the benefit of not just myself, but the viewers as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. If you want to join us in the discussion tonight, 01254 If you're calling us internationally from anywhere in the world, you are very warm welcome uh, to the show, 0044 Unlike other channels, we do not uh, charge you extortionate prices, uh, £1.50 a minute. We charge you the cost of a local call. In many cases, uh, it's usually free. Um, let's just pick up that point Mohammed made. Yeah. That, you know, 
whether you like it or not, you've got a bad reputation. I think we got to look at the reputation and this idea of extremism in a context. Um, the government, uh, under the Labour Party at the time, uh, they brought out this Contest 2, which was a programme in order to try to prevent what they term violent extremism. But they labelled certain things as extremist ideas, and it was an elite government report to the Guardian newspaper in which they said that if you believe in Sharia law within the context of the Muslim world, caliphate, unity of Muslims, even if you believe that homosexuality is a sin in the eyes of uh, Islam, then you're an extremist. So effectively, many of the fundamental aspects within Islam are seen as extremists by certain governments. So those people who call for these aspects of Islam are going to be labelled as such. I think as a Muslim community, what we've got to do is we've got to move away from these you know, constructed artificial labels such as extremists okay, and fundamentalists. You're talking about the government there, but generally within the community, you've got a bit of a reputation problem, haven't you? Is that, is that a right way to...? I think what it is is that perhaps many of the Muslims have for, uh, maybe followed what the media is uh, portraying about the Hizb. Uh, perhaps they've not met or looked at some of the ideas that the Hizb uh, promotes. So, for example, Hizb al-Tahiri looks to establish an Islamic state not here in Britain or in the West, but in the Muslim world. Uh, we're not violent in terms of our work to change the regimes, but rather we believe in working to change it via the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how he established the first Islamic state in Medina, which was through political and uh, cultural means in order to culture the society according to the correct ideas built upon the Aqidah, the belief of Islam. And this is what we seek to do. Okay. Izbut Tahrir was a recruitment sergeant for Al-Muhajirun. It seems to be a stepping stone from Izbut Tahrir onto Al-Muhajirun. One of the things Muhammad was... Yeah. I mean, Al-Muhajirun are a separate organisation. Uh, but you've got most of the members of Izbut, uh, Al-Muhajirun who were members of Izbut Tahrir. They're, uh, they're an offshoot of your organisation. No, I think that's uh, something, again, the government and the media likes to present as a narrative. Uh, rather, what we see is that Hizbut Tahrir is an international organisation. It works in over 40 different Muslim yeah. countries and works across uh, some of the Western countries as well. OK, let, let, can I just interrupt you, and I apologise if I have to, but just, we've got quite a few calls waiting, so can we get through some of them? Uh, Salid is in Birmingham. Good evening, Salid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Um, just a quick question to the brother, actually. Um, this group, Hizbut Tahrir, what, what does it aim to achieve here in the UK? And what is the work that you know they carry out here in the UK? Thank you very much, Salid. What is the... Uh, yeah, so the, should we just go back to the, 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 the bit about Al Muhajirun? Yeah, so um, we're a separate organisation. It's like saying that but the... You're, you, but you're an offshoot, aren't you? Yeah. They, they were an offshoot. They're, they're very disgruntled former members who left Hizbut Tahrir. No, and no, then no, went no. to set up their own organisation with your former leader in the, in the UK. Yeah, I think it was one person that left. Many people have come and left or uh, one particular organisation and set up other organisations. You know, Liberal Democrats were originally an offshoot of different organisations and political parties. Labour Party was an offshoot of the trade unions. But we wouldn't say that they are the same uh, or exactly the same. Like I said, Hizbut Tahrir has been operating since 1953, has been working across the Muslim world, across the Middle East, and also in places like Indonesia, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And thus, our focus is in terms of building an Islamic society, an Islamic state there. What the caller said is, what is our role here? We're here to try and aid that work in the Muslim world, and also to help preserve the Islamic identity of the Muslim community here, as well as present Islam uh, and the Islamic beliefs and values to the wider non-Muslim society. But well, I'm just going to go back to this Al Muhajirun thing because I think it's because because you had a former leader Omar Bakri Mohammed who left your organisation yeah. to set up his own organisation, but he took quite a number of your members. No, no, he didn't take. I think he took. Uh, I think he recruited some youth to his organisation. But we're talking about something which was about 16, 17 years ago. Uh, like I said. Uh, Part of the work of the Hizb is in the West, but it's a small part, part in comparison to the global work of the Hizb across the Muslim world. So it's disingenuous to reduce the Hizb or Hizb al Tahrir to uh, another organization. And I think that's what we've got to do is try to make an informed understanding of that. They are two separate organizations and they have two separate mm. methodologies as well. Okay, well, let's tackle that issue. What do you think of terrorism? 
Okay, so we believe that any criminal activity is prohibited. However, what the West seeks to do is they seek to label somebody who goes against their foreign policy as a terrorist or an extremist. And I'll give an example of this. No, but I'm just talking generally, somebody strapping a bomb on themselves, blowing themselves up uh, on, on July the 7th, the same day your conference. Um, yeah. In the US, the, uh, the planes? Yeah, so the, uh, killing... You, you, you condemn right. that without so, reservation? So, kill, yeah, condemn it without, without reservation. Yeah, so what it is is that we don't believe violence against any individual, any civilian, is a legitimate, strapping bombs. But we have to look at the context of the problem. What we, uh, what we see is that the Western governments, the Western media, says that the problem is some individuals that are strapping bombs. But they forget about the carpet bombs that took place in Baghdad and Iraq. They forget about the massacres that so took place excuse in the Palestine. Terrorism. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that you've got to look at it in, in a balanced way. Rather than talking about the tragic events and the criminal activity that have taken place in the West, which are isolated in comparison to what the medical journey Lancet said was up to a million people that were killed in Iraq due to Western intervention or Western invasion. Okay. Let's go to East London and talk to Shokat Saab. Asalaamu Alaikum Shokat. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Welcome to the show, brother. What would you like to say? I've got a question to your host, um, which is basically, he mentioned the global work of Hizb al-Tahrir. Um, if you can expand on that. I mean, uh, I've heard recently that in Pakistan, uh, Brigadier, he was um, basically, I, th I think he was convicted or something about... Um, Brigadier Ali was convicted today, yeah. Okay. That's right. So basically, my, my question to your host is, um, he mentioned about the global work of Hizb al-Tahrir internationally in the Muslim countries. If you can mention about that work, how it's progressing. Inshallah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Brother Shokat there, who is from East London. We've got quite a few Twitter messages. I want to get through them as well. Um, so, yeah, we were talking about... Uh, it's amazing the calls. You lose your thought, uh, a sense of thought. So, as but a his, we believe in working. We're talking about terrorism. That's right. We? And yeah. I, like I said, as his but Tari, we believe in working according to the method of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how he worked to establish the first Islamic state in Medina from Mecca. And we see and we study that he undertook non-violent political struggle in order to change the society. In terms of the global work, as the caller mentioned, I think his name was Shoka. We work to establish an Islamic society unity amongst the Muslim countries and the mechanism of the Khilafah which we believe will help to establish or bring about the Islamic solutions to some of the problems that we see of poverty, of crime, of corruption, of tyranny, of oppression that were taking place. So we want to change that and work to see a change in terms of a positive agenda that Islam can give via the mechanism that the Prophet wasallam detailed called the Khilafah system. So in Pakistan, for example, Brig Brigadier Ali was uh, arrested for uh, treason and other um, accusations of being associated with your organisation, Hizb al-Tahrir, and um, he's been found guilty today. So you, so, so, so you kind of support military coups? See, what, what's sad this was, about... This was, this was a yeah. potentially a military coup, wasn't yeah. it? No, no, we, we, uh, to be honest, we, I don't know personally about the case of Brigadier Ali Khan. I don't know his situation. Uh, in relation to, I can't comment upon that. What I can comment upon is that there is a problem within the Pakistan military where they, you know, implicitly, secretly make deals with America in order to uh, allow drone attacks within the Muslim world. They allow uh, agents, American agents like Raymond Davis, to run around, even kill people, and then be freed back to America. We see that the uh, Pakistan, some of the senior brass within the Pakistan military, get $1.5 billion per year by the American government. We have seen the fact that the sovereignty of Pakistan in collusion with the Pakistan military has been broken uh, with, uh, with America. So we see that there is a problem. And in fact, if you look at the Brigadier Ali case, one of the reasons why he was arrested is because he went to the, uh, the uh, Ashfaq Kiani, the general, and he, he accounted him on the issue of why was it the sovereignty of Pakistan was broken in the assassination of Osama bin Laden. And it was on that premise that he was initially arrested. So, you know, if we're looking at who are treacherous, we see that the killing of ordinary civilians within Pakistan by the drone attacks, by the, top, uh, by the collusion of the Pakistani or some other people within the Pakistani military with America, that is what we see as really treacherous. Okay, but you still support military. What we support. What do you, how, how the do you, okay, the change. Okay. Yeah, let's take a call. Let's go yeah. to Luton and talk to Ali. Ali, Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikumsalam. What would you like to say, brother? 
Yeah, just a quick comment and a, a question to the to your speaker. Just, uh, I think this uh, whole thing about the narrative about coups and counter coups and whoever supports and doesn't support. The West is plagued with coups and counter coups, but nobody has anything to say about how some of these despots and dictators were put there, obviously by coups and counter coups. We should have came in as a coup, with a coup. Nobody said anything. In fact, people started dealing with him. So really, I, I find it a contradiction that when we talk about coups and counter coups and military takeovers, you know, it, it's alarming and suddenly it's extreme. But I want to get back to your your guest for tonight. Well, I'm not I'm not really suggesting that, have I? I've just said that the, the he Brigadier Ali has been arre uh, arrested and charged and convicted uh, yes. uh, through the court system. I'm not I mean, necessarily I'm not, saying I'm that. Not, I'm not um, alluding to what you've said. What I'm saying is that how come it's it such a fuss? We kick up a fuss when this coup word is mentioned, when the Muslim world's history is plagued with coups and counter coups by the West. So it makes it all right if the West do it. We might as well jump in and join in. Not at all, not at all. But the question is, when is it that we highlight the contradictions of what the West has done in the Muslim world? Okay. We don't speak about that quite openly and frankly. Coming back to your... Well, I, 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 just one more thing, if, if you don't mind me, brother, before we move on to what you want to talk about. Uh, we actually have, have, we do have those debates here on my channel on a regular basis. Uh, you would okay. like to say something else? Thank you, brother. What yes. would you like to say? Just uh, to your speaker, um, I think you've had uh, Abdul Wahid on there some time ago, and the whole debate came back to... Who is Hezbo Tahrir? What do they do? I'm more interested in what the speaker, your guest, is on there for tonight. What are your solutions for the Muslim world? Mm. Muslim world is poverty-stricken. All right. Thank uh, you very much, uh, the, my Ali from Luton there. Uh, what are your solutions? We, I was hoping you'd steal my thunder there, Ali. We wanted in the second part of the show look at the solutions. Talk about demystifying some of the myths about Hezbo Tahrir in the first part. And then second part, uh, we want to go in and talk about the solutions. Uh, and I'm sure you come well prepared uh, to talk about solutions as well. Uh, we'll do that after the break. Uh, so if you want to join the discussion, um, my Twitter seems to be down on, on the internet at the moment. So uh, if you are tweeting me, uh, just bear with us. It's, uh, it's 01254 if you want to talk to me. And if you're on Twitter, it's Amishafiq UK. I'm hoping this will get sorted uh, hopefully very soon and I'll get through some of those tweets. And uh, last but not least, the official on my channel page is on there. Um, so... So you would, I mean, the, the reason I'm trying to get down to it is that how do you get from a philosophy, uh, a, a, an ideology or uh, an aspiration to re-establish the Khilafah system from a, a textbook into reality in the 21st century in the world we live in? Well, we, we've seen partly this occur. Partly. It's not complete. When millions of people came out onto the streets in Egypt, we saw millions or hundreds of thousands in Tunisia. And when the society and the people are politically motivated based upon a common set of ideas then the governments collapse the, they cannot maintain their political order and this is what we're doing we're seeking to try to create the correct political motivation from the society from the people based upon islam yes obviously that's going to filter into different factors or different segments of society to the teachers to the doctors to people even within the military as well that they will come together and they will help to form a new society. Like I said, we've already seen change or a certain level of change occur with the removal of Mubarak, which was outside of the political process. But what we want to do is we want to build that nature, that desire for change upon the Islamic basis, giving confidence to the, to the people that Islam is what they need and Islam, Islamic solutions will bring about the lasting and permanent change. And if you, want, if you want to give that choice, do you want to give the choice to the people or do you want to impose it on the people? Well, it, the method of the Prophet wasallam was about going out and winning hearts and minds, was about culturing the society, convincing their opinions and their thoughts and their ideas that Islam is what they need to live by. And this is the method that we approach. So you... I'm, I'm confused. We, you know, we, live, we, live, we live in a yeah. time where, where there's democracy, there's referendums. Are you going to go down that path, ask the people what they want, or are you just going to yeah. say, well, this is what we, we want to do and we'll, we'll go ahead and do it? Yeah, I think, Shafiq, it's what you said at the begin, beginning, isn't it? All of the different countries, from Morocco you know, to Egypt to Tunisia to Libya, they've all been voting in Islam. We know quite clearly that the Muslims, they want Islam. They want Islam represented in government. They want Islamic solutions. They also are calling for the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem is, is that the election, electoral system as we have it currently today, within places like Egypt, as an example, you had the military, SCAF, 
military junta that turned around and cancelled the parliament, which had the majority 60% from Hizb nur and Ikhwan al-Muslimin. They then uh, passed an edict in which they got widespread legislative powers. And they also gave themselves the right to produce the constitution. So effectively what they did was they managed the, the type of system that they wanted to create and then allowed certain individuals in order to be voted within that system. Certain individuals deemed too Islamic like Abu Hazin from the Hizb nur party so they suspended his election, uh, suspended his candidate. Uh, candidate. Um, so this is what we're seeing. So to go through this political process in order to create change, you're not going to create change. Mm. And we've already seen that change occurs outside the political process. And we've seen that with the removal of Mubarak, the removal of Ben Ali, the removal of Gaddafi, and inshallah also the removal of Bashar al-Assad. Yeah, but, but, that, but, but people are calling out for democracy, aren't they? They're calling for freedom, the right to choose their government. So if they want to choose... Islamic parties, then, then those Islamic parties are winning, aren't they? Right. I think uh, there's two things. Firstly, is that the Western media likes to promote this narrative that these uh, uprisings are somehow secular liberal uprisings. Whereas what we have seen is that many of these uprisings have started in the Masajids. Many of them are saying that we will die, we'll become Shaheed. Many of the people are even making the declaration of faith when they're ordered to make sajood to Bashar al-Assad, as we've seen in Syria. And there are slogans that are now being chanted, which you don't see on the BBC or the CNN, where people in Syria are saying, a shaab yurid khilafa min jadid, which means the people want a new khilafa. So, you know, it's, it's not what is being presented in the Western media. When you actually understand the, the feelings and the thinking of the Muslim people in this region, you actually see that well, they're very They just want Islamic. the right to choose their leaders. Yes, and Islam... And they, wanted, they want corruption to be uh, finished and they want a better life. Yeah, and Islam gives them these practical solutions to these problems. So elections is something that Islam allows. Okay, let's go to London and talk to Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Okay, well, if you are waiting to uh, speak to us tonight, please just bear with us, because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to interrupt our brother Sharif uh, mid-sentence. Um, and, and so if you, do, uh, if you do get put through, uh, just stay there, bear with us. Uh, listen to the debate as it's happening, and then we'll come to you as soon as we can. Um, Arsha, uh, well, my Twitter is down at the moment, so if you are tweeting me, I apologise. Um, I'm just waiting, I'm trying to see why there's something wrong with it again for the second time in, uh, in, in a week. Twitter's down again. Um, but anyway, Arshid Ali says, I can't understand how an organisation is formed first and now they're looking for their, for their leader, which is Khilafah, and they don't know who he is and how, who is going to be elected. But that's a serious point there, isn't it? Okay, Khilafah is a system. Yeah, the, the system is Khilafah. Yeah. But how do you determine who the leader is? Okay, so in Islam, it lays down seven categories or seven conditions to the ruler. So a person who is sane, mature, male-free, just, capable, he's a person that can uh, stand for to be the next Khalifa. The problem is, is that some Muslims think that in order to talk about Khilafa, we reduce it down to one man. And what we try to say is that actually the Khilafa is a political system, an economic system, a judicial system, a social system. There's a whole system that needs to be in place in order for people to come about and rule it. So we're here to present uh, the Islamic systems, the Khilafa system. Yes, we have people that we believe that could present themselves as being capable leaders within, within that political system. But if you're going to judge whether the person's capable or not, judge him based upon the solutions that he brings to the table and where those solutions stem from, i.e. do they uh, stem from the Aqidah, the basis of Islam. Okay, hold, hold that thought. Let's go to Bradford and talk to Irfan. Asalaamu Alaikum Irfan. Again, uh, just bear with us. I know you're very eager to come on air, but if you stay with us, uh, once you're put through, you'll hear the debate, and that means you're being put through to the live studio line, and we'll come to you as soon as we can. Uh, if I'm in Bradford and Mohammed in London, please do call back. But we know, let's be honest, let's just take Pakistan, for example. You know, is he going to be a... In which part of the country is he going to come from? Is he, which province is he going to come from? Which school of thought is yeah. going to come? Is he going to come from the Jabundi school of thought, or the Aladi school of thought, the Brailevi school of thought, the Shia school of thought? See, it's uh, the, the, the issue about having different madhabs, different schools of thought within Islam, 
has not been a problem in the past. We've had Khilafah where we've had the Hanafis, Shafis, Hanbalis, Malikis. Yeah, we've had Sunnis and Shia. We've had Zaydis and Sunnis as well. So we've had different, uh, you know, different sects, different groups that have lived comfortably under the Islamic State. So this is nothing new. Uh, it's a problem that the West sees because the West had a problem with the different Christian sects that existed within it and that the oppression that they meted out to their own Christian brothers because they came from a different uh, theological stance. Something that Islam didn't have problems with because Islam recognizes that when you have the Khalifa, the Khalifa doesn't adopt in personal matters. But, but come on, let's be honest. I mean, you, you've got this textbook uh, approach that you're developing tonight, but on a serious level, how are you going to unite the people, the Sunnis, the Shias, the Wahhabis, um, or the, the, the Ahlidis, or you know, the Brailwis, and, and, and within the Brailwis, there's, there's several different groups, you know, uh, will the, you know, I mean, just, it's just a logical point of view that the people can't uh, visualise that there's going to be some person who's going to unite all these groups. Yeah. I've been told it's time for a break. Sorry, I've taken your no thunder away. Let's uh, take a break. We'll come back after a break. Uh, there's quite a lot of you on Twitter now. Uh, Twitter's back up. Um, Criticising uh, the choice of topic tonight. The whole point of having a debate is so you can air your views and get involved in that debate. Uh, so rather than just criticising me and uh, criticising me, which I don't mind at all, I'm used to, uh, maybe you can be a bit more constructive and uh, just give us your comments. Uh, it's time for a break. Uh, join us after the... Yeah. So, so you, you, I'm pretty 110% certain, uh, and I'm sure our viewers will tell us, um, that the Jabundi's brothers wouldn't accept a Brailwi president or a Khalifa. Would the Brailwi's accept one who was a, well, a Jabundi or a Well, at the moment. And then you've got the, yeah. you've got the, you know, you've got the Shia brothers and sisters who, are, um, who don't even accept some of yeah. uh, uh, the Khulafa Rashidin. And so you have that uh, added problem as well. So I, I, I'm just trying to, you know, I, I, without being disrespectful, yeah. you've got this textbook idea, but... It doesn't fit the reality on the ground in, the, in, in Pakistan or Shafiq, in Bangladesh. Shafiq, or in right, the reality on the ground is that the Shia, the Sunni, the Brelvi, the Deobandis, they live under a tyrannical secular regime. Yeah, they're not turning around and saying, well, he's not our brand of Islam. That's not the argument against these people. The argument against these rulers are these people are not looking after our affairs. What we're saying is that the type of Khilafah that Islam envisage, or Islam orders to be implemented is that which doesn't look at the individual's belief in the branch aspects of his faith, like maybe you know, his debates of whether uh, the Prophet is of Nur or not. It doesn't look at enforcing one view or the other, nor does it look on how does a person pray his salah or not. You know, does he pray with his hands here or below his okay, navel? So there's pra practical so, use of times. Yeah. We, on the issue of Milad, for example, we've got a group of uh, Muslims uh, from, if you like, the, the, the group I follow, who say that celebrating the birth of Prophet Sallallahu is allowed uh, and it should be encouraged. And, you know, they have the processions. And then you've got another group of brothers from the Jibundi or the Tabliki or the Wahhabi or school of thought who, you know, don't believe it's allowed and it's, a, it's, it's an innovation. Um, and because of that disunity, wouldn't the Caliph make a ruling? What was acceptable was not acceptable. People can debate and discuss within the confines of the administration. They can have different views. We live in a society in Britain here today where you've got conservatives, liberal democrats and Labour Party. Who would have thought two years ago that liberal democrats would have come in union with the conservative party? So, you know, uh, this is not unusual. Uh, for some reason we think when it comes to Islam, the Muslims can't work together and cooperate. And like I said, when I talk about the history, the history we had Khawarij who used to call some Muslims Kuffar and they lived mm. under the Islamic State. We have always had Shia and Sunni divide within the Muslim uh, under the Islamic I've State. I've got two, two, two quick feedback points because I'm very conscious and I, if you could keep them brief. Um, Jamal Vickery says, can you pass over my thanks to Brother Sharif and his Butharif? They are very active in the community and give me dawah uh, and Jazak brought me into okay. Islam. So uh, that's a positive story there for you. And then the other one is... Um, um, when I return, uh, when I return, says, uh, ask the guests to establish Khilafah and the Muslims do. So why doesn't he go there? Because our work is global. We have priorities here, which is to help support so the community. Or, or no, no, to, to help support the community here to build the and preserve the Islamic identity here, as well as work in the Muslim world. Our main work is within the Muslim world. 
So obviously if it, the argument would hold true if Hizb ut tahrir only existed in the West and then trying to call and establish an Islamic State in the Muslim world. No, no, we exist mainly primarily in the Muslim world. It just happened that some of our members moved and then started to interact with the local communities in the West and that's how the Hizb grew. So we support that work. But we also support the community here in order to try and present Islam to the wider society as well. So there's lots of facets to our work uh, Primarily though it's about bringing about Islam as a way of life through society and governance in the Muslim world Okay, and then there was the question um, Okay, we'll, 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 we'll come back to you and, and, and so let's just get back uh, because yeah. we, we were hoping to talk a bit more about the conference But you know, okay. you know what live TV is like the, the conference is in Manchester on the, on the 7th of July That's right Have you purposely picked that day because of the no, anniversary no, 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 of, of July not. the 7th? It just happened to be coincidence and it wasn't yeah. uh, anything to do with that Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I've been asked to ask that question um, and, and, and certainly Anybody can go? Anybody can come along? Anyone you don't can necessarily come. have to be a member of your organisation, no, no, a supporter. No, no, no. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. You've got it's open, open, those. open for everyone to come down to it. Men, women, you know, uh, Muslims, non-Muslims, they want to hear some of the Islamic solutions that we want to present. You know, it's open for everyone. And how can people get in touch and find more information? Is their website address? Yes, if they go to hizb.org.uk, there's a link where you can actually buy tickets online as well. And there's food, families. There will be food preserved. There will be refreshments. There will be segregation as well. Well, there'll be desi kana, you know. There will be like, biryani there. Yeah, so so inshallah. You know what our people are like. You know, you have to give right. them some good food. We're going to try and give them chai as well, and maybe yeah. samosas as well. Inshallah. Oh, fantastic! And um, speaker-wise, who are you, who have you, who, who are we expecting? So we've got uh, Taji Mustafa, who's uh, spokesman of Hizb Tahrir. We have Abdul Wahid, uh, who's also a spokesman of the Hizb. We've got Jamal Harwood, a convert to Islam, who wrote a gold standard report in which he talked about how we can develop a currency built upon the gold and silver standard uh, rather than the fiat-backed currency, which is you know, ultimately worthless paper currency that we currently have today. So we've got some people who have expertise in terms of presenting the Islamic solutions uh, to the Muslim world. And, and this is the time to have that conversation now about how does Islam address some of these key problems? Like we said, we are seeing uprisings across the Middle East. We are seeing Muslims gravitating towards Islam in their droves. Uh, so we want to engage in that discussion with our community, with the Muslims, internationally as well, in order to say, look, these are what is, this is what Islam can deal with, whether it comes to economics, whether it comes to the political corruption, whether it comes to how to elect a leader. This is what Islam states. This is our heritage, and this heritage was actually built upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Okay, and so uh, I think uh, we've got a few more minutes, I've been told. Okay, fantastic. So, I, I mean, generally, how do you, do you envisage a referendum for the establishment of Khilafah? I mean, there's two options, isn't yeah. there? There's the military option, the coups which you've kind of supported in Pakistan through a Brigadier Ali, but, or there's, there's, the, there's the Egyptian model. Yeah. Uh, President-elect uh, Mohammed Morsi of, of, of Egypt, who's going to take office next next week. I think, yeah. Um, his his, his yeah. method, which is to is to get involved in the democratic process, to get elected, and then to change. Yeah, I think we've things. we've seen how change actually occurs, not through a political process or the current corrupt political process. For example, Soviet Union changed from a communist country to a capitalist mm. country. It wasn't through the political process. The American Revolution wasn't through the political process against the British. Uh, in order to establish a democratic independent state. So it's not the case that you have to go through the political process in order to create change. We saw that the Prophet ﷺ was able to convince the leadership within Medina, the Banu Aws and Banu Khazraj, yeah. were able to create an opinion within society in which they accepted the Prophet ﷺ as their leader, not only their prophet but also their political leader. Political leader. And that was in a society in which you had mushrikeen, you had idol worshippers, you had Jews, you had non-Muslims as well as Muslims. And you even had munafikeen, people who are hypocrites and wanting to subvert Islam. So he was able to manage it through the solutions of Islam. We are in a situation that actually we see across the Muslim world the support for Islam. Yeah, people wanting to see genuine Islamic leadership and wanting to see genuine, genuine Islamic okay. solutions from the Sharia. Sharif, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. We could, we could have gone on for hours and end. 
Uh, the Twitter uh, feed is going absolutely crazy now. It's working again. And uh, Facebook as well. I apologise if we've not been able to get through. Uh, we have promised that we will organise a debate about Izbut Tahrir. So we have the two sides and, and we can have a good, honest debate. Um, hopefully when we get some scholars uh, to debate with them, uh, we'll do that. Tomorrow we talk, we carry on this debate about the, uh, about the uh, Arab Spring and we talk about Syria. We've got guests coming from Syria. Uh, who, whose family members have been killed and so we'll be talking about Syria, we'll take a live calls tomorrow night, debate night at 10 o'clock. Good night.